first speaker is Les Judd, and Les had his first flight with uh, Captain Snook, which he was endeared him to Brian Hernan, and you all know why. And Brian was uh, found this out when he was going through the information that Les had. Um, then he joined the Air Force and graduated as a pilot. And then after the war, what did he do then? Let's have a quick look. He um, joined the education department, became a headmaster, and finished up in charge of the film education uh, branch, where they produced all these films. So, with great pleasure, I ask uh, Liz Chubb to come up and talk to you about restoration, and he'll tell you what he means. It's the um, understatement of the year, because I've yeah. got very little to say, because all the things I'm going to show are mainly self-explanatory because you'll read them yourself. So don't complain to me afterwards if I press the forward button and suddenly you find you didn't have time to read it. Now, <laughs> that wasn't the one you were supposed to see first, so I either pressed it too hard. That's what I need to say. That box contained one of the most valuable aircraft in Western Australia. It was owned Actually, John Markham actually uh, put the remains of a fox moth in that, in that five foot long box. And then he sent it off to New Zealand because I had a feeling that there are four sorts of enthusiasts about aircraft. It's the general run of us who would walk past you. If you saw the contents of that sitting on the floor of a hangar, you would walk past and give, hardly give it a glance. Then you have the people who are professionals then you, but you also have the enthusiast, that's the sort of guy who will prepare to spend years and years and years, mainly because of lack of money, and go and have a, an aircraft like that restored. Then there's the, the, the professional who will look at it, the um, cash registers run through their minds very quickly and they think, now what is that likely to cost to put it back into its original condition? Then we have a fellow like John Markham who walked got in contact with one of these professional people in uh, the South Island of New Zealand, shipped it over to him, the engine went in a separate box, and this is what John actually went over and found there ready for him to try out. So that's John flying over to the South Island of New Zealand. And he wanted to show everybody else what it was like, so he flew it into Langley Park for everybody to have a look at it. You know, this whole business is about these people that restore aircraft. And of course, you can see what his fox was. Some of you will recognise it has the very lines of another aircraft, which most RAAF pilots knew about because they all flew into Tiger Moss. But the fellows that flew this one, they assured me, even with the cabin on it, it would even fly faster than the Tiger Moss, you know, which is not very fast at all. <laughs> and so this was where it was put on public display on the Esplanade, and so it went on from there. It's already sitting in a, a hangar over here. Well, this is really about the Catalina we've got here in, in uh, Bull Creek. I don't know if any of you have never seen it yet, but it's well worth a visit because this started, and I'm going to show you in a moment, how it originated in Texas and what the state it was in. And you'll see this in a moment. Now I'll tell you why I have very little to say. Don't complain if we go to another one. This is because there's been a conflict of what its background was. I spoke to, emailed a man who lives in Iceland, had all the details of this particular aircraft. What to look like? Bigger pun? You're going too far. <laughs> I don't read that far. He has a trapdoor handle down here that he's going to pull when I get through my 15 minutes. So. <laughs> <laughs> but this, these people who restore aircraft seem to be quite undaunted by what the rest of us might do. You know, when you see an aircraft looking like that, you think, what don't we be 
planning to do something about that. And so this is some of the corrosion, some of the things that these fellows had to, well, they have to face up to it every day they're restoring aircraft, whether it's a tiny tiger moth or whether it's a, a, a great big Catalina or something else. I mean, it looks an utter wreck. But unless you've been to the museum and see what it looks like, it looks like a brand new aircraft that's come off the factory floor. Everything on the aircraft to be had to be completely checked. It arrived in bits and bit pieces. And they are the guys who have actually put it together. The guy in the front, he is the fellow who does all this. He was actually flown out from Texas to supervise its reassembly at the um, at the Bull Creek Museum. This was the the night they handed it over. The Australian government took charge of it. They had a night, and they all had a, a big tuck in, I, bet, I gather, for handing it over. Then the whole aircraft had to be dismantled again, and every part of it had to be put into containers, shipping containers. And then what happened? They wrapped it up in plastic to protect it. The wings and everything else, as I said, were in containers. And this was... Now, the American service were so very generous to wartime Australians, whether in the Marine section or the Air Force or the Army. They were always handing over things readily. And so it, it was landed on this particular Navy ship. And this is when it arrived out at Bull Creek. There are a whole lot of slides between before these sorts of things. This is where it landed when I, <coughs> I went over to uh, Bull Creek to watch it arrive. And the young guy up, up on the roof, he was the directing, the crane driver what to do. You'd think he was, did this every day because that aircraft had to be carried from around the corner, round to this side. This is the back entrance to the museum. You wouldn't believe there wasn't enough room to get this aircraft through the doorway. So they had to get the wheels off. But you would, wouldn't believe it. But the starboard, mo the starboard wheels wouldn't come off. But with the help of a sledgehammer and an industrious uh, Aussie bashing it, finally freed it, they were able to get the wheels off. And there's Bob Schrader himself. That's the guy who supervised the whole reconstruction. Now, there's something like, I believe, 40 volunteers that give their time to the museum. And they were the fellows, under his supervision, that actually put this aircraft back together. They were actually fellows stretched out on the ground with their feet up, holding parts of the wing, because these fellows who were there had to put in hundreds and hundreds of tiny little bolts about an inch long. This is when they were getting it through the doorway. It was a real squeeze. Because once the, uh, the wings were all put together again, they all had to be lifted up onto the hull of the aircraft, bolted on again. And so this is how these volunteers spent several days getting this together. But <coughs> before they started it, they'd already been there moving all the aircraft out of the way to make room. That's Bob. They had to get those propellers put onto splines, so it was a bit of jiggling around to get the propellers up in position, then bolted on. But some of the uh, the fellows, the volunteers, they'd undoubtedly had some experience with Catalinas because it went like clockwork. Hopefully, the rest of these are the internals. So if you've never seen inside a Catalina, this may be your only opportunity to see it. That's where meals were prepared. So there you've had a quick flash through. That actually belongs to a, a set that I've made for to go with a touch screen monitor. 
because the Catalina Foundation have got funds and I'm hoping they'll have a touch screen so any visitor coming in will be able to look at it at the speed that they can devote to the time of looking at it. Normally I'd make this into automatic so they go through automatically. This is deliberately left so any visitor would like to look at it, could flick through as fast as they like, because there's something you like about, I think it's 78 pictures in this particular series, but I really have to give commendation to the men of the volunteers who really gave up days preparing and helping it put this aircraft together. But it's a most fabulous looking aircraft. It looks quite immaculate. But the fact that it is a 5A is quite true. But getting a Catalina originally was a most difficult job because they weren't like you could go into any place and find one available. They were lucky to get this one, and it is the amphibian, so it can land. But the RWF during the war certainly used amphibians because they were used on the air sea rescue. They often picked up injured crews, and then they could come back to Darwin and other places and actually land and have them into hospitals in no time. So the RWF, although a lot of the ones that came out from America were five A's, the RAF decided to take the wheels off because they could put more mines and more bombs and greater fuel load and do other things. So they actually took the wheels off in quite a number of those that did arrive. But is, uh, if you just heard, it is a 5A, which it wasn't the usual one that the RWF used at war. Anybody else? But they certainly had wheels on them down at Matilda Bay. On some of them, I have saw them there. Oh, well, that's fine, because yeah. I was only seven. In fact, it was just oh, about a month before I joined the Air Force that I actually went aboard a Catalina for the first time. I was in the Air Training Corps as a sergeant, and uh, that was one of the um, perks, I suppose, that sergeants got, and a group of us were taken down. I have no recollection of any amphibians, but as you said, there, there may have been amphibians. But in the main, the, all, the, all the ones I contacted in the States they never flew the amphibians, but there could have been amphibians for many reasons. But I've actually made uh, four PowerPoint productions about uh, Catalinas, and one's about the RAF cats at war, the other one's about the United States Navy on the Swan River, the other one is about Qantas and their secret flights to Ceylon, while the other one is about RWF RAF mines, where all the pilots did their conversion onto Catalinas.